Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone. And thank you for joining us for the first webinar in our series, Learning and Adapting During COVID-19. My name is Molly Chen, and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. I am a Senior Monitoring Evaluation Research Learning and Adapting Specialist in the Global Health Division at RTI International and co-founder of the MERLA Community of Practice at RTI a 70 plus member community of staff members who work in MEL, research, program management, business development, and cross-sectoral technical areas. Like many others, we at RTI are grappling with a new reality with the COVID-19 crises, which has profoundly affected our lives and has challenged the way we normally implement our work. RTI's Merla community of practice is excited to kick off this series with a fantastic panel today of leaders in our international development field. We hope that you, our colleagues, friends, and thought leaders will enjoy having a space to hear from others in your field. I'd like to take a quick moment to acknowledge that we will not be using videos throughout the webinar today. Due to bandwidth and potential connectivity issues for our colleagues across countries, we hope to provide an ideal listening experience while you view our slides. As Shane mentioned, we will hold a Q&A session at the end of the presentations, and we would like to welcome participants to submit your questions throughout the webinar via the Q&A feature located on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Today, I'm honored to welcome our speakers, who I'll introduce in the order they'll be presenting. Sonia Moldovan is the Director for Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning at Mercy Corps. She's a development practitioner with more than a decade of experience implementing MEL systems, developing learning agendas, and managing evaluations. At Mercy Corps, Ms. Moldovan leads the MEL team, provides technical assistance to program teams, conducts annual CLA workshops, and contributes to thought leadership on resilience measurement and adaptive management. Sharon Backers has worked for RTI International for eight years, during which she has focused on providing critical support for the elimination and control of neglected tropical diseases. She previously was the Chief of Party in Mozambique for the Envision program and has been working for the past three years in Ethiopia as the Chief of Party for the Act to End NTDs East program. Her work focuses on supporting and strengthening ministries of health throughout all levels of the health system, ensuring quality implementation of work plan activities and effectively measuring project outcomes to support learning. Stacey Young became USAID's first Agency Knowledge Management and Organizational Learning Officer in November of 2019, leading agency-wide knowledge and learning approaches and architecture. Dr. Young also co-chairs the Multi-Donor Learning Partnership, a group of nine major donor organizations working to advance organizational learning and knowledge management in international development. She previously served as a senior technical advisor for USAID's first agency-wide learning agenda on the journey to self-reliance, and from its inception through 2019, she led USAID's collaboration, collaborating, learning, and adapting work to integrate a holistic approach to knowledge and learning across USAID's country programs. Now, I'd like to invite our first speaker, Sonia Moldovan, Director of Monitoring, Evaluation, and Learning at Mercy Corps, to share her story. Thank you so much for the introduction. As Molly mentioned, I work at Mercy Corps and I've been with Mercy Corps for over three years. And as for many of you, this has been a challenging environment to implement in. I will be primarily talking about how we're learning and adapting at the program level with a monitoring evaluation research and learning lens. I'm going to be primarily talking about top, the top three actions we've been taking. Uh, those top three actions focus on contextualized messaging, technical program adaptations, and revised monitoring evaluation and learning activities. Prior to going into detail on those top three actions, I do want to mention that like most organizations, we've taken on measures both at the headquarters level as well as at our program level to ensure the safety of all of our teams, our participants, and our local partners. We have um, instituted remote working. We have provided internet access to those that may not have it so that they continue 
to do their work. We have provided tablets as needed um, for our team members that are working from home. Um, those tablets are typically already procured by our program teams and available for surveys. And since we're not conducting surveys, we've provided our team members with access to those tablets. And in addition to that, we've implemented webinars on health measures that teams can take to prepare uh, for COVID. We reach millions of participants every year through our farming, agriculture, resilience, peace and conflict programs. Um, we have a platform that also reaches small businesses, both in the United States, in the Middle East, and in Africa. We are using our existing platforms to develop contextualized messaging, which has already started, to ensure that all of our participants have factual information about COVID-19 in local languages. We have a lot of lessons learned from our work on the Ebola outbreak about the importance of having adequate uh, information and the right information. We are aiming to reach those that are most vulnerable and to ensure that, again, this is done in a very safe manner, whether that's with print media, whether that's with WhatsApp, whether that's through SMS. Um, what we really want to ultimately achieve is avoiding contributing to a climate of fear, and we want to reinforce positive messaging wherever possible. We also realize that it is critical at this time to engage those that work closer with us, whether that's our community members, whether that's our local government actors and national government actors, and ensure that we first understand what their response is and support them in that response, as well as influence that response. We're mobilizing um, volunteers in our camps throughout Syria. We're uh, mobilizing um, our volunteers to, that have been trained on disaster preparedness, and we're connecting our local leaders to local government groups to ensure that the right messaging is um, advocated at both the program level, but also for our community members, our participants, and those that really need that information. Um, we're very purposeful with our messaging and using feedback from our team members to ensure that is culturally sensitive, and we're leveraging technology whenever we're able to. One of the key questions we're receiving is around monitoring um, at this particular point. What is it that teams need to do? Should they still be conducting monitoring? If we are doing cash distributions, do we still need to continue to monitor? And the answer is yes. We have provided very detailed guidance for our teams that will be shared with you after this webinar that allows them to think through what is realistic. Should they be conducting um, remote focus group discussions? Should they be using SMS and conducting some post-distribution monitoring surveys? Um, should they be taking pictures during distributions rather than getting close to the participants and asking them to sign their names. So we're working through the different scenarios and answering questions. Um, our technical team is also working with different um, country programs to understand what is happening to the market. We're doing a rapid market assessment in 20 countries in Africa to really understand what is happening to the availability of goods, to the prices of those goods, and how can Mercy Corps better position ourselves to support not only our participants, but the market system. Um, one of the key um, messages we've been emphasizing is the importance of data protection. As we're moving towards um, using different platforms to collect this information, just the importance of continuing to protect that participant data and ensure that the best practices that we've developed for data protection are still in place. Some of the alternatives that I already mentioned that will be detailed in the guidance uh, that you're all welcome um, to look through um, will relate to surveys. We, as I mentioned, inclu are including guidance on how to conduct phone surveys, how to sample, um, when you're conducting uh, phone surveys, um, how to use other internet-based platforms. Uh, same for group discussions. Um, for on-site monitoring, we are looking at the possibility of getting secondary data from either community members. In Syria, we're using our volunteers uh, that already live in the communities to give us some of that monitoring data. 
and we're also doing a lot of training and continue to do a lot of training on the majority of our programs. And we're exploring different options for doing more internet based uh, and video conferencing platforms where that's available. And finally, I would just like to highlight an example of one of our programs that's working um, in Eastern DRC, and it's a program that's focused on food security, funded by the Bureau of Food for Peace. Um, the team has revisited its priorities for the next three to six months and adapted its activities to build resilience for the communities that are now dealing with an additional shock. Uh, that area has also had an Ebola outbreak in the past um, and there's been other environmental shocks that have been experienced. The team is scaling up activities including those activities particularly focused on food security. So they're scaling up their cash distribution, their food access activities, and they're also scaling up their wash and slash health interventions activities. They're doing this because this is a currently a need in the community and they want the participants, they wanna mitigate our participants exposure to this shock. Um, in addition to this, the team is looking at how they need to scale up their monitoring activities using existing mobile platforms like ComCare, like the SMS platforms they're already using to continue to monitor what we're seeing in terms of outcomes for these communities that are participating in our activities but are also experiencing a shock from COVID-19. Um, I will be happy to answer any additional questions you have or provide other examples of other programs that are adapting at Mercy Corps or what we as an organization are doing. Um, and um, just wanna close this by saying that we are all learning. Um, this is the first time we as an organization have had to work in countries that are all at a level three. And we're currently in the process of developing a survey to get some feedback from our country teams in terms of what we as an organization can do to be more supportive, given that we're all working remotely and given that everyone is experiencing this differently. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. Um, before I introduce our next speaker, I just wanted to remind everybody that we are um, taking questions through the Q&A function that you can access at the bottom of your toolbar. So feel free to pop in questions there um, and we'll be sure to address them at the session um, at the end. Next, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Stacy Young. Thanks, Molly, uh, and thank you to RTI. This is a great opportunity for USAID to hear from our implementing partners on how everybody is addressing COVID-19. So I really appreciate this opportunity. So where are we? Um, we are uh, individually, everybody's really stressed out. I think our attention is fractured. I think everybody has been experiencing that a lot. And um, that is the nature of confronting a crisis while also enduring it. As a workforce, we're shifting from in-person and on the ground to remote work, and that includes in the field. And uh, globally, obviously, we're facing a pandemic of proportions that we don't understand, but that we know are really um, going to be tremendously consequential for our global work. Um, and so the fact that um, this is rolling out the way that it is re requires that we address all aspects of development at once. Um, this is a health crisis and an everything else crisis, as Sonia's example from the DRC indicates. And so that poses particular challenges to us in knowledge and learning and adapting. So for instance, uh, the, the information that we do have about uh, the primary um, health effects of COVID-19 is quite sobering. And it's, it's also difficult to get a lot of information, but um, some of the information, just a few data points to sort of get our heads around what we're dealing with. 10 African countries have no ventilators at all. Not that ventilators are producing very promising outcomes in a lot of places. Um, many places that all of us work in are experiencing really profound existing disease burdens. Uh, for instance, India has one quarter of the world's total tuberculosis cases. And in a number of countries, care and treatment of cancer and cancer and other serious conditions is being scaled back or eliminated. So those are some of the broad 
uh, data points. There's a lot of uh, information available to us through the media, as well as through um, think tanks and multilaterals. Um, so for instance, um, the uh, estimates about what's happening in um, some of the most congested slum areas in the world where COVID is emerging in really cr congested, crowded conditions. Estimates that in Brazil, the, the current reported cases are about 12 times um, uh, what has actually been reported and the consequences for people whose immune systems are already compromised. So the primary impacts that we need to understand and anticipate are, are pretty daunting and have to do with disease burden, with uh, health surveillance and healthcare systems that are, that are pretty weak and not necessarily working all that well. But then there are the second order impacts, so-called second order, and I say so-called because in a lot of parts of the world, these uh, second order impacts are, are being felt even before the disease is taking hold at scale. And so that again poses particular challenges for us in the knowledge and learning and adaptive management spaces. So a few data points on that. Um, at the international level, China's 50 year period of economic growth has ended. Uh, so that gives rise to concerns about how we're going to pull out of this economic depression globally that, that is anticipated. 100 of the IMF's 189 members have applied for, for uh, emergency funding. Um, in a number of countries, there have been reports of xenophobic attacks against members of communities perceived to be responsible for COVID. There are restrictions on migrants' movements across borders. Of course, we saw news on that just today uh, that affects our neighbors in Central America. At the national level in a number of countries, we are seeing already um, really dire consequences resulting from um, government responses to the pandemic that are brutal and counterproductive. So widespread police brutality as governments impose lockdowns and crowd poor people indoors. Um, and responses that are also opportunistically authoritarian, taking advantage of the virus to advance authoritarian measures. Impacts on the economy, on markets and trade, on individual livelihoods and food security are, are uh, quite pronounced in some places and projected to get worse. Risks to security posed by rebel and terrorist groups taking advantage of gaps in government services in the absence of security forces. And then of course, risks to vulnerable groups such as the widely reported spikes in gender-based violence and expulsion of LGBTI people from their homes during times of lockdown. So all of this is really daunting, right? However, we're not starting from nothing. We have a lot of experience to build from, and Sonia touched on some of this as well. We have lessons learned from previous pandemics, such as Ebola, but also from previous disasters, such as the Haiti earthquakes. And, and these include not only lessons about the response, but also lessons about how to figure out how to assess the contexts and the impacts, how to figure out what information is important, what lessons to capture, what learning to share, and the intellectual frameworks around all of that. So we have that to draw on. We also have lessons from developing humanitarian assistance in ways that lay the groundwork for shifting from uh, humanitarian assistance to development support. So doing the early work in a way that uh, paves the way for and reinforces the later work that we'll need to do. We have a lot of learning about the importance of collaborating with local communities and eliciting local knowledge uh, and uh, local approaches. So for instance, um, recalling the Ebola crisis, what we learned collectively in the development sector about the need to engage local leaders to understand how to advance safe burial practices that were palatable uh, in accordance with local customs. Um, we have remote monitoring methods that we can adapt to the context, and uh, Sonia talked about some of that as well. <clears throat> and we also have um, examples of how to conduct evaluations in a more compressed timeline, uh, including real-time evaluations that help us do that adaptive management as we go. So some of the things that are already happening in our sector um, are that our professional development workforces are adapting to remote work. And, and here I'm talking about all of us, for instance, doing this webinar remotely, but also in the field. 
So um, at USAID, for instance, additional authorities being delegated to Foreign Service nationals who are now our workforce on the ground, um, or the remote assessing or monitoring work that, that uh, our organizations are shifting. Many of our organizations we saw, saw from the poll at the beginning of the webinar are figuring out what kinds of programmatic shifts we need to make. A lot of our organiz organizations are synthesizing and sharing lessons learned and doing this around uh, um, national and regional issues, but also on a sector basis. And then I've seen some examples as well of crowdsourcing lessons and peer learning through listservs or um, uh, the um, uh, African Development Bank is doing a, a hackathon. Um, there are some other examples of z those kinds of crowdsourcing efforts. But what else needs to happen? What else can we do? One of the things that's really important in times of crisis is that we um, speed up the peer learning and knowledge sharing. And in a lot of our organizations, that requires that we flatten our hierarchies or where that's not possible that we um, uh, put in place um, uh, democratic uh, knowledge exchange forums that can inform the work that's being done through the, the formal hierarchies. Synthesizing and sharing information and learning about COVID impacts, so all of those second order impacts as well as the health impacts that I was talking about earlier and how our organizations are responding and what's working. Um, leveraging CLA and other learning about how to manage adaptively. A lot of us know a lot from our respective organizations about how to shift our practice in an agile way. Casting a wide net for knowledge sources and eliciting local knowledge and perspectives is really important right now. Uh, so pulling on those engagement skills that we have in the learning space and those techniques for listening to and partnering with local solution holders is really important. And then of course, learning agendas and, and crafting and implementing learning agendas that are grounded in scenarios about what we anticipate COVID impacts might be um, that are developed and implemented collaboratively with our stakeholders and that are phased to address the questions that we need to know right away and then the things that we're going to need to know later. And, and of course, the learning agendas above all focused on utilization. So it, it's a lot and it's really difficult work. And, you know, I think um, a lot of people talk about feeling overwhelmed, um, but I think that there are some silver linings. So one is that uh, we're all working now in more flexible work environments. Maybe some of that will stick. I was gonna make a bad joke here about sweatpants, but I think you guys know what I mean. Um, there's also an opportunity to elevate local knowledge. The more that we rely on uh, taking the lead from how COVID is affecting people in local contexts and how local leaders are responding, the better off we'll all be. And I think that that's a practice that if it takes hold would really serve us well in development long term. And then finally, uh, we can use this as an opportunity to learn what a truly global response entails to a global crisis. And perhaps we can apply that to other global crises such as climate change. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. Um, and now I think we are able to uh, connect with Sharon Backers. Um, I'll introduce her again quickly. Uh, Sharon is the chief of party of the Act to End NTD's East project in Ethiopia. She is experiencing a thunderstorm in um, at us right now. So let's see, Sharon. Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me, Molly? Yes. Oh, great. Thank you so much for your patience. Yes, there's a thunderstorm and internet's a little bit wobbly anyway. So let's just hope um, if I'm talking fast, it's just because I want to get through this so before the internet goes. Thank you so much for having me on this call. I'm really honored to be here. I'm going to be talking a little bit about how programs are adapting during the COVID-19 um, crisis. As Molly said, I'm based in Ethiopia. So you know, this is, this is a crisis and there are already so many underlying factors that are going on here. So, you know, it's not easy. It's very challenging and, we, you know, we have to think about the wider picture and, and how this affects the ministries, especially the Ministry of Health at a time like this. Um, so, yes, USAID's Act to End NTD's EAST program. 
It's an amazing program. It's a global flagship project providing support to 13 countries in Africa, Asia, and the Americas. So our focus is on mainly eliminating NTDs, strengthening health systems, and supporting country-owned and sustainable platforms, control and surveillance. And I'd, you know, I'd like to add that a really unique part of, of this program is really about how we listen to the government's needs and, and how we can help them and support them. We obviously don't want to step on anyone's toes. So I think we're really good at listening um, to the ministries and the government in general. So I really like that about us. So COVID-19 in Ethiopia, I think, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is, you know, this is hard on top of already where we are in, in you know, with a weaker health system that we have, in, have here. So this is like, uh, yeah, it's, it, it already feels like a challenge. We had the first case of COVID-19 on March the 13th, and to date we have 114 confirmed cases. Um, we're not sure about the quantity of testing. I'm sure it could be a lot more, but then again, we, you know, there are um, challenges with um, equipment and the numbers of, of tests available. The federal government has announced several preventative measures, um, and some of these include ban on mass gathering, school closures, which has happened about a month ago, and also land border closures. Um, the regions have also taken similar measures to control the spread of, spread of the pandemic. NTD programs during the COVID-19, how does that work? And how do we, how have we adapted? So I want to talk a little about that because that is really super important. Um, the, on April the 1st, uh, the World Health Organization issued an interim guidance for NTD programs, recommending that community-based surveys, active case finding activities, and mass treatment campaigns for neglected tropical diseases be postponed until further notice. This was also in discussion with USAID and in line with our government with government policies. So since then, NTD activities have stopped. As many of you know, many of the NTD activities include um, wide community uh, participation. So we definitely weren't able to carry on with those activities. The challenges of the new normal. We're working from home. This has been a really interesting aspect since mid-March when uh, our RTI office in Ethiopia has start, started to work from home. Um, we found that remote working is much harder than working from the office. Um, there are so many different layers and different challenges that come with that. Working from home is not necessarily a normal concept in Ethiopia. Um, work is work and the home is home. So mixing those can be difficult. Um, so there's, we've really, as a team, we've really shifted our mindset and trying to understand how that looks like and how it works. Um, power supply and internet connectivity pose daily challenges, even hourly challenges. And that really is, uh, that really disrupts your working day. Um, I was actually exactly at that point saying <laughs> how challenging <laughs> the internet um, can be and that's when I dropped off, so yes. Um, also just looking at the impact of not going to the office and how that, how that affects people on a daily basis. We're so used to our role and, and being that person who is a specific, um, who does a specific tasks in the team and in the office. So, yeah, it's been a, a very interesting mind shift with the team, but I mean, they're very uh, resilient and been, you know, just been great about it. Um, um, so, how do, what, what are we doing? What are we learning? And sort of like, what are the next steps? Uh, USAID's NTD programs are not being adapted to provide direct COVID-19 response. However, in the absence of field activities, we are supporting the Ministry of Health where and how we can. We're sharing information. Uh, we're planning ahead for NTD programs to resume activities. We're maintaining the commitment to support countries in reaching their NTD control and elimination goals. I mean, I think that's really important just to really mention that the commitment is 100% still there. Uh, community trust is important to achieve our goals and we will continue the activities once it is safe to do so and of course in collaboration with the ministry. Our donor USAID and RTI have shown exceptional support and understanding as we're working with staff at many levels to adapt to a changing working environment. We have frequent communication and open line to our CEO and senior leadership. 
Our, we have frequent communication and open line to our CEO. And um, sorry, we have a global health uh, VP is checking frequently with all chiefs of party and has made himself available at all times and, and really created space for regular check-ins. So each country is also learning from each other, from the Philippines to Ethiopia. Um, we're, we're just learning from each other and, and adapting together as well as RTI. And again, this comes, I feel like, a lot from the donor as well, the support that we get. RTI has really also shown support for employees with their children, family members, and other obligations. It's not a cut and dry, you do 8.5 hours at home or anything like that. So much has been taken to consideration and also the context of different countries, which is really, really, you know, it, 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 yeah, there are no words for that. Um, establish new, in, in the field, establish, establishing new communication systems amongst the team has been essential. So either on a daily basis, we WhatsApp, we email, we call each other. We really have ways to check in on each other, not only on each other's health, but family also and deliverables and just all around check-ins. Um, it can be up to five plus calls per day with specific uh, team members, depending on what we are uh, working on. But it's also just that keeping in touch and, and making sure everyone is okay. Um, I think a lot of this, what has come out of this is really great a focus on personal connection. We are, we are a very close team already, but just this, just this looking out for each other and looking after each other has really shined through. When, as we are increasing in number of uh, COVID-19 cases, we try to counteract to that with, with a photo of some, you know, one of our children or, or something that light and note. Um, and I really appreciate that the team are involved in that as well. It's the work balance life is, is, has, um, is sometimes difficult, especially when we're working from home. So we really try and encourage each other. Um, the commitment to maintain and engage staff despite their family situations um, has also, you know, been a big step forward. Um, so I really would like to thank them for their, just all their collaboration and cooperation. I'd like to finish off with a picture of the team. Honestly, as it's been an honour to lead them and be part of this dedicated team. And I'm confident that as we go on to learn and adapt, um, grow stronger as we always have done and as mentioned before Ethiopia is no stranger to challenges and um, this is another one that we're just going to learn from and get stronger from so thank you very much I'm sorry for all the interruptions on my side thank you thank you Sharon and thanks for being such a good sport um, she has been just fantastic um, throughout of all these dry rehearsals, et cetera. And so, and I also wanna thank uh, Sonia and Stacy for sharing their stories with us. We applaud each of you for making lemonade out of lemons at a time when it's tough to go out and buy lemonade. So I just wanted to kind of close with, um, you know, when we were preparing for this web webinar, an interesting phenomenon was occurring every day. As every day, every week passed, I noticed how fast the world was changing with the COVID pandemic and all the rippling effects on our daily lives. I think rarely are we asked to learn and adapt so quickly without any warning, without a precedent or lessons learned to easily follow. So I'd like to thank the speakers for their leadership, for their commitment, and for their courage to share their stories today that really allow our international development community to learn from them, each other, and hopefully opens up the space for us to continue having these conversations. So uh, without further ado, I would like to open the floor for Q&A. Thanks to you that have already submitted questions, but if you'd still like to submit a question, please um, do so now through the Q&A box located in the toolbar below. We do ask that you do try to limit to one question so we can get to as many as possible. So I am gonna jump right in. So there's a question from the audience. Um, does Mercy Corps have suggestions on getting data from rural locations where internet access is not readily available or community members may not have access to mobile phones? Yes, so we've received this question quite a bit and my suggestion was going to be to the extent possible, if there's somebody in the community, if we're working with a village elder or a village leader or a youth group in the community and someone in that group does have access to phone, is using them 
um, for some minimal information gathering purposes. In addition to that, while we still continue to use some of our partners that are from communities to implement some activities, and we've trained them on all the safety measures, including using protective equipment and so on. Um, and so we encourage our partners to collect some of that monitoring information and we provide training to them prior to that. Um, so it's been really relying on our network of both local partners, local community connections, and as I mentioned, the case in Syria, local volunteers. Great, thank you, Sonia. So my next question, um, uh, our next question is to Stacy. Stacey, um, would you be able to elaborate on what you meant by elevate local knowledge um, in, your, in your last slide about what we can do now? Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, uh, I think the example I gave is uh, maybe one that people are familiar with from the Ebola response, um, but I can uh, talk a little bit more about that and then make the connection to COVID. So um, during Ebola, uh, you might recall um, either from your work or just from general media coverage that there were attacks on health teams that went into villages to try to um, take care of the people who had died. And um, they were trying to implement uh, safe burial procedures that actually were counter to local custom. So uh, in many places, local custom is that the family has the opportunity for three days to um, care for the body of the person who has passed and then, um, and then do the burial. But that was identified as um, an opportunity for transmission. And so health teams went into remote areas and they were repelled by local people because they were seen as um, threatening local custom. And there was also misinformation being circulated about how they themselves were uh, bringing the Ebola virus to communities. And so um, the uh, international health workers pivoted and started working with local leaders uh, to figure out how to mount a, an effective communications campaign about exactly what they were there for and the importance of safe burial, um, the uh, customary practices being one mode of transmission of the Ebola virus, and to um, uh, get local communities um, to embrace a different approach that uh, gave families the opportunity to grieve, but at a safe distance. Um, so then, so the important learning there was that um, if you don't engage local communities, if you don't um, avail yourself of knowledge about what motivates people's behavior, then um, your efforts are unlikely to be effective and in fact can be really strongly counterproductive. So looking at the COVID response, one of the things that we see in a lot of places is that there has been this adoption um, by national and local governments of a more Western version of a stay at home order, right? Where uh, those of us who are lucky and are not risking ourselves on the front lines um, with other essential workers, but we're, we're working at home, we've been told to stay at home and to keep our distance from people. In a lot of developing countries, what we're seeing is governments imposing that same order, but in a context in which a lot of people live in very crowded conditions, and it's actually more dangerous to be crowded indoors with other people than to be able to be outdoors and safely spreading themselves around. Um, that also has, has uh, gone hand in hand with um, some of the violence that I was talking about before. But that, that's a situation in which hearing from uh, local leaders, uh, local communities about what their needs are uh, would really um, result in a better effort than just this sort of wholesale adoption of a Western model. So it, that's just like one of the early pieces of learning, but no doubt there, there have already been a lot of lessons at the local level that really need to inform what um, international development organizations do. I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Stacey. Sonia, a question for you. Uh, does the adapting of mill activities 
Has that led to significant changes in the MEL plan across Mercy Corps implementation, um, considering that some of these approaches were not previously anticipated? So this is something that uh, we're currently working with our AORs and donors on. Um, so teams are adapting and we're encouraging them to document that adaptation. So we provided guidance um, that includes just project management guidance in addition to MEL guidance um, and how to document the adaptations accordingly. Um, we have spoken to some of our donors and they're deferring to just the local team members that are either the AORs or the COTARs in the country to make the decisions in terms of what adaptations to make and how it affects the MEL plan. One example was in Uganda, we are in the process of having a midterm evaluation for a large Food for Peace funded program. The team arrived in country from the US just as the case, the COVID cases in the US were increasing. Um, so the team did not feel comfortable going into communities having just arrived and not knowing whether on their travel or in the US they could have been exposed. So in coordination with USAID, we made the decision to conduct an internal review versus a broader evaluation that would include focus group and key format interviews uh, with our participants. Um, so those are some of the discussions that we're having in coordination with our donors that are having implications on the MEL plan. However, if the question is, are we upfront updating all these MEL plans, the teams are adapting on such a rapid basis that what we're really encouraging is let's document everything what we're doing and then let's adapt the MEL plants as we have time. Wonderful, thanks Sonia. Um, so I think we've got Sharon back on the line. Uh, Sharon, I can repeat that question from earlier as well. And since we've got you on the line, why don't we <laughs> take advantage? So we were talking a little bit about local knowledge. You know, there was a specific question about whether there has been um, specific NTD, oh, excuse me, specific messaging around NTDs and COVID-19 um, messaging going out in Ethiopia. Um, in addition, if you guys don't mind, I'm just gonna put them all together really quick for Sharon, is uh, you know, another question is talking about how other country offices are working to adapt to challenges. Um, it'd be really great to hear um, how you're building additional resilience into, into your, uh, your team um, within our organization as well. So Sharon, hopefully you're there to answer that bunch of questions I just This next question is really open-ended. So um, Sonia, uh, Stacey, Sharon, feel free to jump in. But So as many organizations are working to collect updated information on the ground, revolving, evolving needs, um, have organizations uh, found any effective strategies to share information across other organizations to increase the availability, to be able to respond without each organization trying to implement its own strategy, its own assessment. Um, so maybe I'll start with Stacy, um, especially if, as you're part of this multi-donor um, learning partnership, it'd be, it'd be great to hear from that perspective. Thank you. Sure, yeah, thanks for the question. And I'm sure that I don't know the full answer to this, but I can give a couple of examples of things that are taking place. Um, so one thing that is happening right now through the OEC DAC EvalNet group is that evaluation um, points of contact across a number of development agencies are exploring opportunities for uh, conducting joint evaluations, um, for uh, sharing information across their agencies and so on. Um, so there, there is that structure through which that kind of sharing is being planned. Um, I'm not aware of any um, uh, sophisticated or inclusive um, sharing process that's going on. Uh, maybe maybe um, there are things that are happening uh, on a sector basis and so on. I think the, the multilaterals and the think tanks play a really important role here in terms of synthesizing learning that's coming out of various uh, development organizations. <clears throat> and then, um, yeah, through the multi-donor learning partnership, we uh, have been having a conversation among ourselves. Um, so these are nine donor organizations that are working really um, in a peer assist mode with each other. Uh, we um, are donors that invest a lot in uh, knowledge management and organizational learning. 
Um, so we, we had a conversation recently about what's happening across our respective organizations and um, the things that, that we're doing really fall into three basic categories. So one is that business continuity category. Another is the um, programmatic response. So building on lessons learned, um, figuring out how to reorient our programs and so on. And then the third piece is capturing emergent lessons. Uh, so that we're learning in real time as we go. So different organizations are doing different things. One of the member organizations has, for instance, a community of practice of knowledge management practitioners, and they've repurposed that community of practice to focus specifically on COVID-19. Um, another organization is doing um, remote workshops on uh, remote appraisal methodologies so that um, they can continue to monitor but also to, to plan for their uh, programmatic shifts even as their workforce um, is uh, differently configured. Um, let's see, yeah, some, an, another member organization is doing um, a lot of sharing around learning from uh, the Ebola response and so on. So there are a number of these different um, efforts underway and in that partnership, we're just trying to learn from each other about what's working. Great, thanks Stacy. I guess uh, if Sharon's back or if Sonia wants to hop in on that question. Yeah, I'm back. Oh, wonderful, <laughs> hi Sharon. <laughs> Hello, <laughs> yeah, I'm back. <laughs> Great, Sharon, um, did you want yeah. me to Keep some of those questions or I know we've yeah I didn't hear them I was already off by that point no problem well we're, we were you know talking a little bit about local knowledge so um, mm -hmm. and uh, specifically there were some questions about whether there's been messaging around NTD activities and COVID in Ethiopia um, and, you know, has this been delivered to communities and was this in coordination with USA and also there's been some questions about, um, you know, whether you've heard of other country offices um, also doing some of the adaptations that you have implemented, mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in this time and just kind of talking about that sharing. So please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks so much, Molly. I'll start with the, the last question. Yeah. So the other country offices, we are in touch on twice a week and we're all doing we all have a very similar approach where that we have a close we keep in close relationship to the mission and country as well as the ministries and as well as um, other international NGOs just to see what else you know if anyone else is taking different approaches so I think they are really key keeping in touch with US mission here in country and also the ministry because you have to triangulate that information um, so as far as I know, yes, the other country officers are doing the same thing. When we speak every week, it's very much, yeah, it's a similar approach. And I think that's the best approach to have as well. Um, the other question I think was about NTD and messaging and COVID, not yet. Um, we're not there yet, but tomorrow we'll be having a virtual meeting with the ministry. And this is how far we've sort of had to adapt. We've never had virtual meetings before. Um, and tomorrow will be our first uh, virtual meeting led by the ministry with the NTD partners and where, you know, and hopefully, I mean, the connectivity, I can't even imagine, but um, hopefully um, it will work and this could be something that, you know, will be discussed. So they're going to lead the meeting. So I really, I'm really interested to hear what you want to say. Um, so, yeah, I think it's at the moment, it's just been step by step and we're seeing sort of how things evolve. Um, yeah, I hope I answered okay. Great, thanks, Sharon. Um, so I think we'll take one more question. Uh, we will try to also have the speakers um, respond to a few that we aren't able to get to. So thank you for sending these fantastic questions. I think what I'll end with is um, a question about gender. So um, can the speakers address how they are identifying and addressing gender specific challenges created by changes in the workplace for reaching participants and more broadly in terms of restrictions on mobility? Um, why don't I, why don't, Sonia, if, you've, uh, if you'd like to start us off there? Sure. Um, so what we've learned, um, obviously, through doing gender assessments and purposeful gender and inclusion programming is that a shock like COVID typically impacts certain members of our household more than others, typically those members that are uh, caretakers. And 
taking that into account, we're trying to be very purposeful in terms of how we do our distributions and how we um, identify and target the participants during this um, crisis. So we're working, um, as I think it's been alluded to numerous times, but I can't emphasize that enough, we're working with community groups, with local partners to ensure that those most vulnerable are getting the assistance they need. Um, when we um, do our monitoring um, or our short surveys to either identify needs or um, follow up on distributions, we try to um, include uh, as many women respondents as possible to ensure that we're getting their perspectives. As you all know, women also often don't have access to phones. So thinking about using our partners again to reach those mo most vulnerable groups. Um, it is a really valid point. Um, and even as an organization, as we're thinking about how do we promote some semblance of a work-life balance, we are having a very purposeful gender and inclusion um, outlook both through continuous feedback from not only our teams that work in Washington or in Portland, but also our teams that work um, in the 40 countries that Mercy Corps is present in. Thank you, Sonia. Um, well, I think we we are at the hour. So I what I will do is, again, we will share um, we will share these questions with our other speakers to see if there's responses from them, because I know that there's so much to discuss. But um, today, in conclusion, I'd, I'd really I'd like to thank our speakers, our participants, and the team helping to put this webinar series on at RTI. We really look forward to continuing the conversation in our future webinars. So we do ask if you could take some time to fill out the brief evaluation that's just going to show up briefly after this presentation. And it's also going to be emailed along with the recording of the session. We will be asking um, for and sharing all resources that panelists have mentioned and ask that you, our participants and audience, share any resources that have been useful to you and your organization. Um, be well and take care until next time. Thank you so much. <laughs>